Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody enjoy that little blast of cold we got? I will take the heat being pushed back as far as we can. So, so I'll take if we keep cold, cold blast, keep it away. Thank you, Lord. So, hey, I'm Joel. Hey, I'm the teaching guy here, and we're going to continue our series today called... You got to have it by now. This is our eighth installment of the Name Dropper series. Name Dropper. Uh, if you don't have a Name Dropper in your life, a Name Dropper is somebody who uses somebody else's name to get access to something they couldn't get on their own. And the amazing thing about our God is he says, I go by a lot of names. Every character, every characteristic of God, there's a name for him. And he says, hey, I'm cool if you use my name to get access to the power that I have available to you. So we've looked at many, many different names of God. Today we're going to look at Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. And we're going to talk about what that means in our specific lives. Not just physical healing, but also emotional, relational healing. All the areas that our life needs healing. So this is our eighth installment. We normally don't do series this long, but we have loved this one so much, Pastor Marcus and I, that we, uh, we kept it going. And we have one more next week. And then, well, Pastor Marcus and I have been trying to figure out what are we going to do for the next few weeks for a series. And we really felt, we prayed a lot about it and talked a lot about it, is we decided we are going to spend the entire summer going through the book of Philippians, the whole book, okay? So Philippians is a fascinating book because Paul wrote it in prison. And if you ever got a letter from me in prison, you can be confident it would not be very encouraging. I'd be like, guys, this stinks. This is horrible. I didn't even do it. I, I, really, I really didn't do it. So, <laughs> Paul writes this letter. He's unjustly really in prison. And in this middle of this letter, it's just him talking about how you can be joyful in any situation. He's saying, I'm in prison, but man, there's joy all around. And, and I, I think it's a message for us today because if you look around you, there's all sorts of reasons to be concerned, to be worried, the political situation, all the things going on in the world right now. And, but yet in the middle of that, we can have joy. So what I want to encourage you to do is read ahead. Some of you have been looking for a reason to get more disciplined. We're going to be spending the whole summer going through Philippians. So what I would encourage you to do is get out your Bible and start this week reading through Philippians because here's what's invariably going to happen. When you read Paul, if you're like me, you're going to read Paul and you're going to go, what the heck is he talking about? Dude, what are you saying? Paul had these deep, deep insights into scripture. And what's really encouraging to me is Peter, the guy that hung out with Jesus, he even says at one point in the Bible, he says, guys, Paul writes some really hard things to understand. I don't even understand him, but listen to him. I'm like, okay, thank goodness. Not even Peter understood what Paul was saying, right? So what I encourage you to do is start reading through Philippians. And if you see some questions that are in there, write them down. And we're going to hopefully unpack that over the next few months as we go through the book of Philippians. It's an outstanding book. I actually had to memorize the entire book before I got out of high school. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with myself too. So (laughs) so anyway, I'm just kidding. But uh, I don't remember it all now. But here's the really cool part about it. There are some parts of it that will just pop into my head after years of not having thought about it. The word of God, it says, will never return void. And when you get that memory scripture in your head, man, right when you need it, it will come out. And there's a, one of my favorite Bible verses in Isaiah. It says, the grass will fade and the flower will wither, but the word of the Lord will live on forever. The most important thing you can be putting into your mind and your heart is the word of God. So get through Philippians and uh, we'll be covering that for this whole summer. Cool with that? Well, all right. So a couple weeks ago, I was on my way to Florida and at the airport, I ran into a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years. I was like, oh my gosh, hey, how are you? And started talking, and uh, I told her I was on my way to Florida. She was on her way to see a family member. She said that she had this aunt, I think it was an aunt, who um, was, was like on her last leg, and she was in a hospital dying of this really rare, like one in a million person disease. She said, yeah, it's so rare, it's so bizarre, but she felt this pain in her abdomen. She went into the doctor, she never left the hospital, and now here they're saying she's got three days to live 10 days later. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's horrible. So we prayed for her, and uh, I was like, man, let me know how it goes, and we prayed for her, and I went and boarded my flight. And as soon as I sat down on the plane, I felt this pain in my abdomen. (laughs) And I thought, oh, what is that? I've never, that, that doesn't ever happened. And so I just kind of shifted in my little uncomfortable seat. And then I felt more pain over here. And I was like, oh, I was like, man, I wonder what other symptoms that lady had <laughs> with her one in a million disease. Wait, I'm one in a million. What? It, I'm telling y'all, 
By the time I got to West Palm Beach, I had already planned my funeral. I was certain I was going to die of a one in a million rare freak disease that I didn't even know existed a couple hours earlier. So apparently there's a word for people like me. <laughs> Hypochondriac, a person who is often or always worried about his or her own health. Guys, if you knew how many rare diseases I have died of in my life, <laughs> in my mind, you would, you'd be amazed that I'm here today. I'm like a cat <laughs> on steroids. I have 29 lives. I have died so many times in my mind of diseases because I'm constantly concerned about my health. Now, I know some of y'all can completely relate to this, but I also know a lot of y'all are laughing at me like, <laughs> Joel's such a weirdo. Eh? <laughs> but if we're honest, I know this about everyone in this room. You may not be a hypochondriac about your health, constantly worried about your physical health, but some of you are relational hypochondriacs. You're always worried about the health of your relationships. And you walk by somebody at work that normally greets you and they just kind of walk on by and you're like, oh, did I do something to offend them? And you're thinking about yesterday, every conversation you had with them and you're going, oh, do I so at lunch, you go up to them, hey, man, we good? We good? And they're like, yeah, we're good. We're good. No, but really, are we good? Everything good? And they're like, yeah, we're good. Leave me alone. You're irritating me. Like, okay, I just want to make sure we're good, man. Just, you know, want to make sure I didn't offend you or anything. And your spouse wakes up one morning, he's kind of grumpy. And you're like, oh, no, what did I do? Did I do something this? Did I do? No. And you're always worried about it. You're always worried about your relational health. Right? You're laughing at me. <laughs> Some of y'all are financial hypochondriacs. You are always freaking out about money. And you hear the stock market took a dive. And you're like, oh my God, am I going to be able to retire? And then you realize you don't even have any money in stocks. <laughs> but you're worried about it. And you go, oh man, are we going to be able to make it? Inflation. And you're just constantly worried about, am I going to be able to retire? And some of you, man, you grew up poor. And so you're like, I just, I just can't be poor. And you're just terrified of it. And you're always worried you're going to go, like my grandpa used to say, you're going to end up in the poor house. He was a Cajun. He'd be like, oh, we're going to end up in the poor house. And so you're telling, you know, like you, you're always trying to convince your wife y'all are nearly broke and hiding money in from the bank account. So it looks like you're nearly broke so that she doesn't know y'all are actually doing okay. But you're a financial hypochondriac. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? Listen, we've all got areas of our life where we're constantly worried about our health in that area. I've talked to people who have anxiety and their greatest anxiety is they're, that they're gonna have an anxiety attack. And if, you, and if you have anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. You're constantly worried about having an anxiety attack. I get it. A lot of people, well, that's ridiculous. And I tell people, listen, anxiety is irrational most of the time. And you can't rationalize someone out of irrationality. All your rational thought don't work. My wife's like, sweetheart, this and this and that. I'm like, I understand. I understand my fear is irrational. And all your rationalizing ain't going to fix my irrational fear because it's not rational. In fact, the only thing that will drive that out, there's only one thing greater than fear and it's love. God's perfect love drives out fear. So really what we really need is we all need God's love, which sounds so Beatles and hippie. But the fact is, God's love is actually the source of everything we need. And some of you have some very good reasons for being afraid of those areas. Some of you, man, you're terrified relationally because you got abandoned one time or you got rejected and it really hurt. And you're going, I don't want that to happen again. It's your, your hypochondriac, always worried about your relational health. Any signs about, oh no, maybe they're not in love with me anymore. Physical. I was talking to a guy after the first service. I mean, ever since the heart attack, any weird thing happens in this area. And I'm like, oh my God, it's happening again. Another heart attack. And we've all got these things that trigger us and we get afraid. And we're, we're always just, we're just terrified because there's these parts of us that we just know aren't whole. We know they're not what they should be. And that's where God comes along and he says, listen, I want to be the one who heals that part of you that's broken. Now, here's the challenge with most of us. Most of us, we're more concerned about the symptoms than the actual problem, okay? In fact, I'm convinced of this. We just, 
we just want the discomfort to go away most of the time. But God wants to heal the source of the disease, dis-ease, the lack of ease. I heard a doctor who told me one time, he said, man, nobody wants to be healed. They just want the pain to go away. He said, so they'll come into me and they say, just give me some medication so I can keep doing what I'm doing anyways and the pain won't, go, won't be there anymore. And I'm like, well, that's not going to heal the problem there. I don't care. Just make the pain go away. There was this one doctor. He lived, uh, he was one of the Stoics. And he said, before you go to heal someone, ask them if they're willing to give up what's causing them to be sick. And that's the challenge for most of us. We live in a day and age where you can just get your fix and keep doing whatever you want. But true healing, it takes some time. It takes some work sometimes. I had a guy one time after service. He came up to me and he's like, man, I'm so frustrated. I need you to just can you talk to my wife or something? I'm like, what? And he goes, she left and she won't come back. And I said, well, you know, what happened? He said, look, she said that if I would go to church consistently, she'd come back to the house. I've been here three weeks in a row and she still won't come back. I'm like, huh, well, what happened? He said, well, she left because she said I wanted to be in spiritual and stuff. And I don't know, man, I even brought the kids with me to church three weeks in a row. And I told her and she won't come back. I just want things back to normal. And I said, it doesn't sound like she wants things back to normal. Normal is what got you in this mess. She wants things to change. And he got frustrated because he just wanted the pain to go away. And the pain to him would be like, well, wife's back in the house. Everything's good. And, he, and really what they needed is some major healing. And that's the challenge for most of us is we just want the pain to go away. But God, he's saying, no, I, I actually want to offer you healing. So there's this story where we first hear about God being, calling himself Jehovah Rapha. It's in Exodus. It's right after the children of Israel have been delivered from the plagues. You know, they were slaves in Egypt. The plagues came along and the children of Israel, Pharaoh says, all right, get out of town. You can go. So they leave town. But as they leave town, Pharaoh changes his mind and he sends the army after them. They end up going through the Red Sea. God opens the Red Sea, the children of Israel. And then when the, the uh, Egyptians come through the Red Sea, God swallows up their enemies. So it's like, wow, things are going really good. They get, into the, they get into the desert. And this is where we pick up the story with what happens. It says, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea after this, God did this miracle there. And they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. Pretty important in the desert. You need water. Interestingly enough, you know, you can live for about 30 days without food. But after about three to seven days, you're in deep trouble without water. So they're in deep trouble. When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. In fact, the name Mara means bitter. If you think about the word Spanish, in the Spanish, the word amargo, Mara, comes from that same root word, right? So the people grumbled against Moses saying, well, what are we going to drink? Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and he threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. Now there's some powerful symbolism here of what's going to happen a few thousand years from here with another piece of wood that heals the world. The cross, this picture of you, that was somehow wood, and again, it's deep symbolism. I don't understand all of it. This deep wood, this deep a symbolism of wood healing the water and making it fit to drink and how God comes and through, the, through his death on the cross, he heals the world. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And that's where the word comes. Yahweh Rophe, Jehovah Rapha is how we would say it. The God who heals, who restores, who makes complete. And I'm convinced that the healing and restoration, what he, that what he wants to make complete, isn't just physical healing. He wants to heal all of you. But you know, you can't heal something that you failed to recognize. You go to the doctor when the symptoms show up and then they say, oh, there's something deeply wrong here that we need to fix. In a weird way, sometimes discomfort becomes a gift to us. And, and whenever God reveals, this is something I've learned from Pastor Marcus and Natalie. They, they say this all the time and it's so powerful is this. Whenever God reveals, it's always in order to heal. Amen. And sometimes the pain that you're trying to push, push away or trying to numb it, trying to get, just give me something to get the pain to go away, not just physically, but emotionally. Maybe the alcohol is a, is a way to get the pain to go away emotionally. It's probably pointing to something deeper. And whenever God reveals, it's always to heal. So a few years ago, you know, I lead hikes around the world and I was on this long hike to Machu Picchu and halfway through the hike, my knee started really acting up. 
And when I got back from the trip, it was so bad. Like I could barely go downstairs without it really hurting. And I'm thinking, because I'm a hypochondriac, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I need a new knee. Like, oh no, I'm 38, 30, whatever, I was 40. My knee, it's shot. I blew it out with too much hiking. I'm panicking. I'm like, oh God, dude, what did I do to deserve this? You know? and, and my sister-in-law, she's very even keel. She came along and I was, she's a PT and um, she's very stoic. And I'm like, my knee, I'm like, it's totally jacked up. And she's like, Hold, calm down, let me look at it. So I sit down and she starts poking at it. She gets up and goes, your problem's not your knee, it's your hip. I'm like, what? I'm like, but my knee, knee hurts. She goes, yeah, it's not your knee, it's your hip. And I'm a highly trained professional. <laughs> so I go, well, what do you mean it's my hip? And she goes, your hip is weak and your knee is overcompensating. And that's where the pain's coming from. I'm like, what? The, what? You know what? Sure enough, I started to exercise the hip and it resolved the knee pain. And that's the way it is in a lot of our lives. The pain you're feeling in your marriage is really a symptom of something else. I'm convinced there are no marriage problems. There are just people with problems that bring them to marriage. And if you'll start to work on your own issues, your marriage might be healed. The marriage problems are just a symptom of a deeper issue within you. So we've got to face those challenges, even if it's, and the beautiful thing is God will often reveal the, he'll use pain to reveal what the real issue is if we're willing to lean into it. And that's where he offers healing. That's the promise in Isaiah 53, 5. I love this verse. This is the promise of what Jesus, when Jesus comes, Isaiah says, this is what God is, Jesus is going to do for us. God is going to do for us through Jesus. It says, surely he took our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. He paid the price that you couldn't pay. The punishment was poured out on him. And we get his righteousness, like we talked about a few weeks ago, Jehovah Sidkenu. He's the one who gives us the power to live right. And it says, and by his wounds, we're healed. And I'm convinced that God wants to heal you physically. But even more than he wants to heal you physically, he wants to heal you completely. And there's something way bigger at play. He wants to show you his love as the source of everything you need. And oftentimes the symptoms that we just want to go away are pointing to something that we need to lean into more where he wants to show us more of who he is. But we have to lean into that because this, this is what I'm convinced of. Jesus came to heal everything that isn't whole. If there's something in your life you're worried about, you're a hypochondriac about, whether it's your health, physical, whether it's your financial health, whether it's your relational health, he's saying, I want to heal that so you can get whole and total healing. And this is the really challenging part about it. Sometimes we think we need him to heal something for something to be right. And he's actually saying, no, what actually needs to be healed is something else. My dear friend, James Fields, he just passed away a couple years ago. He was one of the sweetest men I ever knew. And uh, when he was in his teens and 20s, he was actually a really prolific athlete, but he lost 90% of his sight when he was young. And uh, people would tell me, people would tell me, they're like, man, if you knew James back when he was in his teens and 20s, he was a vicious, mean, aggressive man. And I'm like, him? He's the gentlest, kindest, most loving, Jesus-like man I've ever met. And they're like, yeah, but if you would have known him back then. And I talked to James once and he told me, he said, man, I've prayed thousands of hours for God to heal my sight. Thousands of hours. And he never did. But he said something and he wrote it in a book that I just, I stick it with me all the time. He said this. He said, God always heals, but he doesn't always heal the part of us that hurts. He faithfully heals the part of us that hinders love for him. That cuts like a knife. Because, man, we just want him to heal what we think needs to be healed. And he says, no, I got something way bigger in mind. I want total and complete healing for you. And you think this is the problem, but I really know what the problem is. And we're going to take care of that. Because even if your physical body is never healed, when you get to heaven, that'll all be taken care of. And we're looking at an eternal perspective here, y'all. There's something way bigger at play. He's saying, I want you to understand what it means for me to love you and for you to love me. And I'm going to heal whatever's in the way of that. So I was talking to a counselor last week and we were talking about this idea. And I said, so what is it that's keeping me back from experiencing God's love? I just want to experience his love because I've never felt like, you know, some people are like, I just felt God wrap his arms around me. I've never felt that. If you have felt that, I'm kind of jealous. I've never felt God in that way. 
I said, what's keeping me from feeling, experiencing God? And he said, here's what I know, basically from what I know about your personality type. Your problem is always gonna be control. Your need to control things is what's gonna keep you from being healed and letting God, and feeling God's love. And I was like, wow, this guy's reading my mail. He's right, because I feel like I have to control everything. So I started thinking, what are the things that we do that hinder us from loving God and consequently from loving others? And here's what I, I came up with. This is just a sampling of it. It's in everything. I think first one of the things is our need to be right. We need to be right. And listen, some of you men out there, I know, like your ego is so fragile that you have to be right all the time. And everybody else knows you're wrong, but you'll double down convinced you're right. This used to be me. So I know what it's like. Because most of the time, honestly, I'm right. But here's the challenge with it. Listen, even if you're right, Francis Schaeffer talks about this. He says, when you're witnessing to someone, there will come a moment where they will all of a sudden realize that their worldview, their precon preconceptions about who God is, their presuppositions will fall apart. And you, th there's this moment where all of a sudden they realize, wow, I don't have the right answer here. And he says, the key there is not to go step on their throat, drop the mic and go for the jugular, which is what most of us do in our world today. We're like, I convinced them, now let me crush them to show I was right. He says this, he says, when the moment comes that it's shown that maybe they're wrong, you back off. You use minimum necessary force because you may vanquish the enemy and crush them beneath your feet, but the people who have been vanquished and conquered don't usually like to hang out with those who conquered them. And you'll come a moment where you're like, I just know I'm right about this with your kids, with your spouse. And this moment where you're like, I know I'm right. And maybe you are, but here's the thing. At that moment, you back off and you let the Holy Spirit bring conviction because he's the one who brings the conviction, not you. And you use minimum necessary force. And you say, well, I think I've made my point. I'm just gonna let this, as my wife says, percolate. <laughs> I'm gonna let this percolate with them. And you'll find oftentimes when people can come to the conclusion on their own, they make the change. But some of you have been dogging people so hard because you know you've got to be right that that's why they left. Right, left, you get it? You had to be right so bad. And, but here's the thing. You're, if you're right all the time, you are God. Please come talk to me. You're not right all the time. In fact, to grow, you have to admit you're wrong sometimes. And of course, correct. Being right all the time. Our need to be right all the time. God often wants to come to us through our mistakes and show us, let me show you some correction that keeps us humble, right? How about this one? Our need to be the savior and rescuer. Some of you are pride yourself on how you're always there for other people. And you put your time schedule on hold. You sacrifice yourself for other people. And you value how much you rescue and save others. But when it comes to you needing to be rescued and saved, you're too proud to let others help you. And God's like, I want you to experience my love through letting the body of Christ help you, but you won't receive it because you've always got to be the hero. And it's so passive and subtle because it seems like, oh, my compassion, I'm such a loving person. But actually it's pride. And God's saying, I want to show you love through other people. If you'll stop putting your needs on hold, let people come and meet your needs for you. But we have this martyr complex of, oh, I'm such a good person. I just sacrifice for everyone. And God's like, no, I actually want you to experience my love as you let those around you come to your rescue. Anybody got a family member like that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> How about this one? Our need to achieve and accomplish. Man, some of you, you're, you, you get so much value from you, being the one who makes, you're the activator. You make stuff happen. You get it done. And God is saying to you, look, I know you get it done, but I love you no matter whether you get it done or not. Your value does not come from what you do. And some of you, man, you feel so much value from what you do. And maybe you've been incapacitated and now you feel worthless. Maybe emotionally you're incapacitated. And you're like, I used to be able to get all this stuff done. I can't even focus. I just feel so tired and exhausted. And God's saying, hey, let me show you my love right now in the middle of your weakness. When you can't do anything for yourself, I want to show you that I love you no matter what you can or can't do. And oftentimes our need to achieve gets in the way. And he says, just let me love you. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? Martha's running around caring for things that Jesus needs. Mary's just hanging out, listening to Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, Martha, chill out a little bit. Come and hang out with me. I love you whether you get this stuff done or not. Here's another one. I, I, trust me, I'm gonna touch, I'm gonna step on everybody's toes before we're done here, okay? So don't worry. Our need to be unique and stand out. There are some people who just go, 
Nobody understands the pain and suffering I go through. It's so hard being an artist like me. Tormented artist. Nobody understands my pain. And all around you are people who are like, well, let us help care for you and minister to you. And you're like, but nobody understands my, my pain is unique. I'm special. <laughs> and because you're so special, you think nobody can minister to you and care for you. And yet God's saying, man, let me show my love to you. And you're like, yeah, but nobody can understand my pain. And Jesus is all hanging on the cross. And he's like, I kind of get it. <laughs> right? Here's another one. Our need to know and understand, this is me too, okay? I'm pretty much a lot of these, but uh, our need to know and understand or be able to explain it. Well, I will follow God and believe him when I can understand it perfectly. I had a guy tell me that once. He's like, well, once it fits into my brain. And I'm like, your brain's real small, bro. <laughs> there are parts of God that are always gonna be mystery. And if you can't receive his love in the mystery and not understand all of it, it's your pride that's getting in the way of that. You need to understand, this is me. And this is one of the gifts Pastor Marcus has handed to me is, is he says, you know, I don't understand why God's asking us to do this, but we're gonna do it anyways. And we're gonna, we're gonna just move forward with that. I'm like, yeah, but uh, rationally and logically, he's like, yeah, I know. I think we just need to go forward with it. And, and he's right. And I'm like, whoa, I did not see that coming because I couldn't explain it. But there's this mystery of following Christ that we learn. And sometimes God does weird stuff. You go, well, I, I can't explain that. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you're not God. And you need to say, sometimes I'm going to have to move forward in spite of being able to understand it. Here's another one. Our need to be safe and secure. God, I want to serve you with all of my heart as long as you lay out the entire plan for me and then show up the backup plan for the backup plan. And then just a safety net in case the backup plan for the backup plan doesn't work. And then I'll follow you with my whole heart. And he says, that's not how it works, son and daughter. You get to follow me step by step, and you're saying, what, I need, I need a sense of security, and he gets that, but he's saying, the only security you're really going to have in this world is knowing that I love you, and I got your back no matter what happens, so take the first step and move forward, and experience my love right in the middle of the fear of moving forward, right in the middle of the uncertainty, right in the middle of going, I don't know what the next step's going to look like, and it may be a cliff, and he said, yeah, and even if it is a cliff, I got you. That holds us back sometimes from experiencing his love. Our need for pleasure and freedom. Oftentimes these people don't hang out in church because they're just like out uh, fishing on Sunday. Woo, yeah, Jesus, I love Jesus in the fishing. And you're like, hey. sometimes you need to like experience love in a community, not out there on your own, like indulging on your ATV. <laughs> we'll skip the next one because we're running out of time. Um, I'm just kidding, that one's mine. Need for control. Listen, one of the scariest things that ever, that ever happened for me was when I, Found out I had a melanoma and I went to the doctor and my control thing, I was like, doctor, what do I need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And he's like, there's nothing you can do. It just happens. You're a white boy. And I was like, <laughs> like, surely there must be something I can do. And he's like, nope, it just happens. You got white skin. It's going to happen. And I'm like, no, no. And you know what? But, but through that experience, God spoke to me in ways I never could have spoken before because I was completely out of control of it. I couldn't do anything about it. And I had to trust God in the middle of that situation and experience his love in that way. And then the final one is our need for harmony and peace. Some of us, man, we're just like, oh, I, just, I just need peace. And yet you know there's something you need to address. There's a conversation you need to have. And you're like, oh, it's going to cause conflict. And I just, I just need peace. And God's like, I want to work. I want to show you my love in the middle of that conflict that you need to have because there's peace on the other, true peace on the other side of it. Right now, it's just you surrendering. But I need you to step up and speak up and get face off with that issue. And a lot of times we say, well, I just, oh, I just want peace. And we hide away and we don't confront the thing we need to confront. And God's saying, I want to show you that I'm actually oftentimes right in the middle of those conflicts that you would say, I want to avoid. But if you go in with grace and humility and peace, he will speak to you through that. Anybody relate to any of these for other people you know? <laughs> Listen, there's some of us in all of this. And here, here's the thing, honestly, if it comes down to it, it really comes down to one word. It's your pride. It's your own pride that gets in the way of experiencing God's healing and love. You're saying, I got this, God. And he's like, you don't even have the first clue. Let me show you my love to you through this. So whatever it was that we covered this morning, man, my, my prayer for you is this, that you will find healing in God's love. And maybe you've been just saying, I just want to experience God's love. And what's the thing that's holding you back? Maybe the thing that's holding you back from experiencing love from other people is one of those things. 
And God's saying, I want to love you through people. If you'll just get over yourself and let me heal you. And the pain you're feeling, really, here's the real issue at hand. And that's my prayer for us, is that we'd be people who walk and embrace God's healing, live in that healing, recognizing, man, there's always more to heal, but the beautiful thing is Jesus came to bring total and complete healing, body, emotions, mind, heart, anything that needs to be healed and whole, Jesus is the answer to that in your life. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the one who heals us. You know exactly what needs to be healed and you will stop at nothing. So I pray that we would be people that just embrace your grace for that healing. And we thank you, Lord, for your, the freedom you give to us. Pray for those this morning, Lord, that do need physical healing. Lord, you are the one who heals our physical bodies. You walked around the world, uh, rocked around when you were on the world, on earth, touching people and healing them. And you have not lost that power. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead still lives in us. So I pray for those right now that are calling out for healing in their physical bodies. I pray for miracles this morning. They don't even have to come up here, Lord. Right where they're sitting, you come to them and you touch them and you bring healing. And we just, we believe by your stripes, we are healed completely and totally. And I pray for those with emotional scars that need to be healed, wounds. I pray for their healing. For those in their minds, Lord, their minds are just chaos, a wreck, anxiety. I pray for healing for them. We thank you, Lord, for your healing and your freedom. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Christ, this is the first step to getting on the path to healing. He wants to come and forgive you of your sins, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you up with him in the kingdom of eternity. I'm gonna say a prayer, and if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is gonna come and forgive your sin and set you on the path with him. So let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way, we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, welcome to the kingdom of God. If you just said that prayer, we've got some resources for you back under that do it again sign. Man, you guys can stand. I pray you have a blessed week. Go out and read Philippians and don't run from that healing God wants to offer you. You're dismissed. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.